Welcome to Madison Street Baptist Church Online. We are not perfect people, but we have been rescued by a perfect Savior. Now, we exist to make disciples of Jesus. No matter where you've been or what you've done, Jesus can heal your broken places. We are excited you are joining us today. Well, good morning. How y'all doing today? Awesome. I just want to point out a couple announcements in the bulletin real quick before we get started. Um, number one, uh, online giving is currently unavailable. Um, there is a conference today for the budget. Um, Mission Sunday is next Sunday, March 5th. Be sure to bring a covered dish and a dessert. Um, Miss Glenda Bailey um, is having funeral services at 1 p.m. at Little Ward, and so is uh, Jean Pearson at uh, Monday at 2. Um, Glenda's uh, view, or visitation is today, if you want to go to that. Um, that's all I got, so uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father God, thank you today for allowing us to come here, God, and just... Uh, Worship your name, God, and see the, the beauty of baptism, God, and just, uh, Lord, I pray that we, when we leave this place today, Lord, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, God. Amen. If you want to follow along with me, I'm in Matthew chapter 3. Verse 13 through uh, 16. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him and Jesus when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were open unto him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him let us pray father God I pray that uh the baptism uh will uplift you today father God in uh and we'll give you the honor and the praise and glory. In uh, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Always good to be here, isn't it? Uh, be in God's house. Always good to start our worship time uh, with the ordinance of baptism. I want you to be praying for Caleb. Uh, Caleb gave his life to the Lord a few weeks ago and he wants to make that profession of faith public. So I want you to be praying for him, okay? And lift him up in, the, in, in prayer to the Lord. Now, uh, Caleb, if you will come. Caleb, upon your profession of faith that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sermon today, God Answers Prayer. Amen. <laughs> Give us just a few minutes to get swapped here. So our first song is When I've Traveled My Last Mile. So if y'all will, stand and sing with us.
next song, see what's going on while we're getting flipped over here. Our next song is This World Is Not My Home. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day, Father, for your salvation, for all your blessings that you answer our prayers, but most of all, for your word. Father, we know that you are the vine, we are the branches, and we can bear much fruit through you, and without you, we can do nothing. Father, we also pray that you bless Brother Caleb for doing your salvation. Be with him, keep your hand on him, keep him safe. We ask all these things in love in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. song y'all can be seated but um it's so funny how God works because I I didn't know about the baptism when I was picking out these songs but God kind of has a way of you know just putting things in the right place so what a day that will be
to let me get paid.
be seated. Uh, one more quick thing. When I was doing announcements, I forgot to say it, so it's my bad. Um, we have these uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offerings. They're in the back, in the pews, and in the front, right? Yeah. So I uh, just wanted to point out that real quick. Your turn. Let me ask you this morning, if you will, take your copy, your copy of God's Word and turn with us to the book of Psalms, Psalm number 25, Psalm 25, and uh, <clears throat> it's a wonderful psalm, and uh, it's a unique psalm in a lot of ways, uh, just 22 verses, uh, but we're going to try to get through maybe three or four of those verses this morning, and we'll come back and uh, pick back up uh, at a later time. I uh, do want to just encourage you as you're turning, be in prayer for next week. Uh, as Jonathan mentioned in the announcements, it is our Mission Sunday, and Source of Light will be here. Uh, they'll be sharing in the message uh, on Sunday morning next week, and uh, during our Sunday school time, uh, don't stay away because of this, but in our Sunday school time, uh, we're going to go out into the fellowship hall, and there are going to be booths set up uh, around the fellowship hall uh, with all the different departments of Source of Light. A lot of people have asked a lot of questions that have not been able to go, uh, but uh, thought it would be a good Sunday to do that because next week also for us uh, kicks off the uh, week of prayer for home missions. Uh, so uh, be in prayer about that, but also be in prayer for next Sunday. And after our worship time, we'll go out and share a meal together. Uh, so I want to encourage you, if you will, bring a dessert and a covered dish. Um, the church will take care of um, the other things, the drinks and the meat. So I want you to come and be a part of that and enjoy the fellowship. Uh, I think the ones that have gone to Source of Light would be quick to tell you uh, they're some of the most godly people on the face of this earth. Uh, that are in that mission organization. They just uh, radiate with the love of God. Uh, as one old seminary professor told us, he said they just ooze uh, with the love of God. They're wonderful people. Uh, they stay on the mission field uh, basically their entire life, come off of the mission field, and they work there. And some of those that work there are into their 90s uh, and uh, late 90s, still working, still serving the Lord. So I want to encourage you to come next week and be a part of uh, that Mission Sunday. And uh, Dr. Barnes, will <clears throat> he'll be sharing the message, the president and the CEO there of Source of Light, he'll be sharing the message next week. So uh, just pray for all that is taking place, okay? Uh, in um, Psalm 25, when you think about calling upon the Lord, <clears throat> this, as I said, is a unique psalm, and uh, it, it's an interesting psalm because of the content of the psalm. Uh, sometimes we read the psalms and don't look at all that went on to, behind the writing of that psalm. And in David's life, I'll just say this, David's life was in utter turmoil. Uh, and you'll see that through this psalm. Uh, and I think about uh, something I shared with you probably sometime back when I first came here last year. <clears throat> and I went back and just dug that out again. Uh, but during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln made the statement, uh, and you'll see it there on the screen. Uh, he said, I've been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction, uh, overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. Uh, and I think maybe all of us at some point in time, we've been there, uh, been overwhelmed by situations and circumstances and trials and crises in our life that uh, we did not know what to do. We had nowhere else to go uh, but to the Lord and call on his name. And he said, my own wisdom and all that of all about me seemed sufficient for the day, insufficient for the day. And how true that statement is, I think we can all identify with that. Uh, we'll, we'll do our thing and try all we can try to uh, try to get answers or solve the issues and the problems going on in our life. But <clears throat> I think we can identify with this former president and what he had to say that there are a lot of situations in life we just don't know what to do. We're overwhelmed by those things. And God gives us some instruction here <clears throat> on what we can do. 
how we can have answers in a hopeless situation. So uh, I want you to understand some things here. The psalm, this psalm, I'm going to just read the first five verses in a moment. Uh, and, but this psalm, uh, really, of David teaches us uh, how to confront crisis when we have those things come into our lives or come our way. And there are about three or four things I want you to know kind of behind the scenes in the background of this psalm. And that is that David came to the conclusion and he came to this understanding that he was experiencing the consequences of his sins. He realized that what he did had consequences. What you and I do have consequences. Uh, we can make choices, but we cannot decide what the consequences are going to be. And that's where David was in this psalm. He realized that. It may have been, and scholars have so many uh, opinions here, uh, but some say, well, it could have been because of David's uh, interaction with Bathsheba. Uh, and what that did in his life and the consequences that came about uh, because of that. But also, you'll remember in David's life, uh, ever since that confrontation with Bathsheba, uh, God said the sword would not depart from your house, and his house was a literal turmoil and chaos his whole life. Uh, Absalom, his own son, rebelled against him, and David fled the capital city, because he was going to lose his life. So uh, we see that happening in his life. And uh, the suffering of David in this psalm, it's shown to be really deep. And he just pours out his soul, his soul to the Lord. Maybe you've been hurting like that on occasion. Uh, and you didn't have anywhere to turn but to the Lord. But you just totally emptied your soul on the Lord. It's a wholehearted commitment. It's a wholehearted prayer here that David is praying. And as I said earlier, David clearly recognized there's a connection between our sin and the things we go through in life. I do recall many years ago, a seminary professor made this statement, and we've all heard it probably before, but he said, as you go through life, you may choose the sin, but you cannot and never will choose the consequences. God will decide that. And how true that is. You can jot in the margin here of this psalm. Just jot down Galatians 6 verse 7. Uh, God said to not be mocked. Uh, you know, uh, a man that whatever he sows, he's also going to reap that very thing. Uh, so we understand that. And we all heard the old statement. You not only reap what you sow, you reap later than you sow. And you reap more than you sow. I remember hearing this statement quite often. Well, when I was young. I sowed a lot of wild oats. And one guy said one day when we were speaking, he said, I sowed a wild, lot of wild oats. He said, today I pray for crop failure. Uh, and we all understand that, do we not? Uh, we sowed wild oats and we pray for crop failure, but it doesn't come. We reap what we sow. And more than we sow, it goes on for years. Uh, if you don't believe that, uh, just look in the mirror and tell, be honest with yourself. Uh, I can tell you at 65 years of age, I remember things that happened in my life when I was a teenager. And God has not let me forget those. God has covered those with his blood of his son. But the consequences remain. Uh, it's still there. It's still there. This is what David is facing. This is what he's going through. In fact, uh, this psalm is one where David makes repeated requests for forgiveness. Uh, just circle the verses, if you don't mind marking in your Bible. Verse 7, uh, do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. Uh, he prays that there. In verse number 11, uh, he says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. My iniquity is great. And down in verse 18, Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sin. Forgive all my sin. And so it is. We understand Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. We know we reap what we sow. And David is a prime example of that. Now, as you look at this psalm, I want you to kind of understand it's an instructional psalm. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, if we had the Hebrew Bible, every verse... Every verse in this psalm, down through verse 22, <clears throat> every verse starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. 
It would be like if we would say verse 1 is A, verse 2 is B, C, we'd go A, B, C, D, E, and walk down. And the Hebrew writers wrote that way many times uh, because it was an instructional psalm. Uh, sometimes they would write uh, passages. Uh, psalm 119 is a good example of writing uh, a passage with um, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, so they could remember and hang on to it. Uh, and a lot of people do that today. They will use the same letter or whatever of a, whatever they're doing just to, to make it stick in someone's mind. That's what the psalmist is doing here, is that very thing. So now how do we confront? How do we deal with those crises in our life, those circumstances and situations that may be overwhelming? And I'll say this, it may be that you're in a situation, you're going through a crisis that you didn't create. See, we live in a fallen world. <clears throat> we live in a world that is not perfect. Everything doesn't go the way we want it to go. Everything doesn't happen the way we want it to happen. And sometimes we get the fallout from that. It may be something somebody else did, and then we're trying to pick up the pieces and clean up the mess. Uh, we understand that. So how do you deal with all of that? How do you deal with it? How do you... Go to the Word and let the Word speak into that situation. Well, look, if you will, verses 1 to 3, I'll read. <clears throat> and he says, To you, O Lord, uh, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt or triumph over me. Now, some of you, if you hear those words, you probably remember the little chorus we sing. Uh, using those exact same words of this psalm. To you, O Lord, do I lift up my voice. Unto you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Now, we've sang that over and over. Verse 3, indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will, will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day, all the day. Now go back, if you will, to verse 1, 2, and 3. How do we deal with these crises, these situations that come into our life? None of us are immune from the cradle to the grave. None of us are immune from this. But he tells us, first of all, number one, and it's just coming right out of the word, he says, number one, call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord. And there's two things he tells us under that. Number one, that we are to trust. Notice, uh, he says here, trust. Oh my God, verse 2, in you I trust. Trust and call upon the name of the Lord. Trust God. Is David trusting God? Absolutely. He's calling upon the Lord, and his sin brought him to the end of himself. And we see he's left with a conviction that he couldn't do anything about it himself. Uh, and because of that, here he is. Remember, David tried to hide his sin and, and all of these things, and that didn't work. Uh, he tried for over a year to conceal that sin with Bathsheba. And if you read some other Psalms, Psalm 51, Psalm 32, you'll find that David's health, it just wasted away. He began to wax old, he said. Uh, and he finally prayed that contrite prayer in Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. But, but he had nowhere else to go. And friend, you and I have nowhere else to go. How many times is it that we will do the exact same thing? We will exhaust every resource trying to fix an issue or fix a problem or deal with a crisis or a circumstance in our life. And when we finally realize this is not going to work, I have nowhere else to go but to call on God. Call on God. I had a lady tell me many years ago, I was talking to her about a situation she had been through, and uh, I won't call her first name, and, uh, but uh, we'll just call her Sue. Uh, that wasn't her name, but <clears throat> I said, well, Miss Sue, now what have you done? She said, well, I tried this, and I tried, and she went through this long list, and then she finally, her own self, she made this statement, then I finally prayed. Then I finally prayed. I said, why not do that first? She said, I thought I could fix it. I thought I could fix it. God is not our last resort. We need to understand that. He is not our last resort. It's the first response we ought to have is to go to him. David now at the end of himself, 
He is calling out on the Lord. <clears throat> it's like the old song. I, I was looking in the book this morning, that church hymnal. Number 345. Most of you probably remember that song. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Uh, and <clears throat> that is exactly the where David was. What do I do now? Where do I go except to the Lord? And this is what David is doing here. He's presenting his crisis to God who could change the whole situation. And uh, you think about where David is here. He's not only feared, <clears throat> as you read the psalm, you'll find he feared humiliation, but he also feared personal shame. He also did not want to do anything that would bring reproach on God. He finally came to understand that's what he was facing. And he took all of that to the Lord. He brought all of that to the Lord. Look at verse 3. Here it is. He said, Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. The second thing, you not only trust in God when you call on God, but uh, you express your confidence in God. <clears throat> and this is what David does. He not only trusts in God, but he's expressing his confidence in God. God, I know who you are. You're a good God. You're a gracious God. You're a merciful God. Uh, God, when I call, I know you're here. But he says, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait on God. And he reveals that those who trust in the Lord, notice what he said, they will never be ashamed. They'll never be ashamed. Let God deal with it. Take it to God. Did you make a mess? Did I make a mess? Yes, sometimes I do. Sometimes you do. And, and we take it to the Lord. Uh, think about when you were a child growing up. You might have uh, done something you shouldn't have done, got, got in hot water, and uh, you know, and uh, you kind of tried for a little bit. I think I can get away here and just cover this up. And you realize I can't cover this up. So you go talk to dad or you go talk to mom. Uh, and you know, uh, and just come clean. That's what David's doing here with God. He's trusting God, and he's stating his confidence in God. I, I love what he says here. Oh my God, verse two. In you I trust. He places his faith in God. He's running to God, not now away from God, but he's running to God. And he says in verse three, none of those who wait on you or wait for you will ever be ashamed and David knew if he waited on the Lord if he waited on God God's purpose would be fulfilled in his life uh, there's some passages about waiting <clears throat> if you look in Psalm and just turn uh, over to your right there in Psalm 37 <clears throat> verses 3 to 7 and the psalmist here David again uh, notice here uh, he says trust in the Lord and do good Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Commit your way. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait. There it is. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret. Because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Don't, don't fret about those things. Trust God and wait on God. That's what David is saying here uh, as well. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, <clears throat> one of my favorite passages in God's word, I'm sure it's some of you as well. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31. He says, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired or weary. And they will walk and not become weary or not faint. Waiting on the Lord. Now I will tell you, sometimes waiting on the Lord is a hard thing to do. Because God's going to move and work in His time to fulfill His purpose in our life. Now, you may be going through a dark patch right now in your life. Uh, and I, wanna, I want you to know this, God's with you in the midst of that darkness and he's walking through you with it. Uh, he's fulfilling his purpose in you. Just wait on God. Let God have his perfect way in your heart and life. Uh, and when it all comes to light, okay, then you'll understand. Then you'll be able to turn around and comfort and counsel somebody else that's going through the exact same thing. God never wastes a trial. 
Uh, he teaches us great things if we'll just wait on him. Uh, David is here, like I say, a lot of this was his own problem and his own doing. Uh, but when you think about where he's at and what he has been going through, uh, you see here how many times he begins to talk about his sin. He is committed to remain faithful to the Lord. Uh, just in some of the verses here, let me just go back to verse 1 very quickly uh, here and, and just point out a couple of things. He said, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. I lift up my soul. That's He's seeking the Lord. Everything that David is, everything that he is, his mind, emotion, his will, his whole person, that inner person of the heart, it's a wholehearted plea that he's making. Not some just halfway prayer. I mean, he is pouring out his heart to God, grappling with God, wrestling with God. My soul I pour out. And again, in verse 2, I trust. His faith is in the Lord. His faith is in the Lord. And he claims the promise of God. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt or triumph over me. Uh, and this is what he's doing. Just totally, totally surrendered to the Lord in every way. And you look at this and make application of those couple of three verses there. <clears throat> and again, I just go back and uh, note that, you know, in, 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 in our life every single day, uh, we in this fallen world, we will see things and be confronted by things. Uh, Jesus said, in this world you have tribulation. I had tribulation, but I've overcome the world. Uh, you can be one who overcomes when you trust God, uh, when you put your faith in him. <clears throat> and uh, David has come to the end of himself. Uh, and I want to say to you this morning, by way of application to those first couple, three verses there, if, if you've been trying to do all of these things, uh, and you haven't picked your Bible up yet and let God speak to your heart, if you haven't gotten on your knees yet and poured your heart and soul out to the Lord, do that. Do that. Don't take another step before you do that. It's the greatest thing you can do. Uh, you've exhausted every resource. You've listened to your friends, and what, what did that get? Uh, I hear people all the time say, well, my friend told me. Well, what did God tell you? Let God speak. <clears throat> Uh, you've heard me say it, I'll say it again, I'll say it to my dying day. People tell me all the time, well, God don't speak to me. Yes, he does. Open the Bible. <clears throat> the moment you open the Bible, start reading, God is speaking. Amen? God is speaking. Just checking to see if you're still there. God's word is a living word. When God's word says this book is inspired, that word inspired says this in the original. It is God breathed. God breathed. God spoke the word. Men moved by the Holy Spirit penned what God said. <clears throat> it is the alive and living word of God. And my friend, it is powerful. It is so powerful. David here <clears throat> is going to God, the author of this word totally trusting him, relying on him, resting in him, waiting on him. You say, well, Pastor Billy, how long will it take? I have no idea. No idea. I know a lot of people that have prayed prayers for a lot of, a lot of years. But God hears every prayer. God is working. God is moving. <clears throat> We're to fully rely on him, trust him with the outcome. And whatever it may be, whatever it may be, trust God. Trust God. Expect God, listen, expect God to do what he promised. He promised David. David knew it. David was claiming those promises here when it came to the word of God. And you and I can do the same. <clears throat> now I want you to look at the second thing. And we're going to move kind of quickly here. I know we'll, uh, we've got a lot to cover in a short time to get there. Uh, but back in, verse, uh, in Psalm 25, uh, if you look at verse 4 and verse 5, David says, <clears throat> make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truths. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I will wait all the day. All the day. Now, the God he speaks of, he said, first of all, God will show you his way. That's what he's praying for. Look again in verse 4. 
Make me know or show me your ways, O Lord. Show me your ways. David couldn't see it for all that he was going through, the mess that he was in, the darkness he was in, but he believed that God had a way for him and that God would show him that and he could conquer the crisis he was going through. God, you have a way. You have a path. And he says here, make me to know your ways. David prayed, begging God. He's beseeching God here. Now, this, this passage is very intense in the Hebrew language. We don't see it in our English translations that much. But it is as if David is almost, uh, if we could look at it, maybe laying prostrate, just digging in the ground, praying, seeking the face of God. Show me your ways. Reveal your ways to me. And lead me uh, through this crisis. Show me the way out, God. That's what he's praying. And he's turned it all over to God. As we go through those troubles and trials that are confronting us, this is when God is teaching us some very valuable lessons. Uh, you won't have time to jot all of these down. I'm going to read real quick uh, some things I jotted down here. And I think some valuable lessons for the Christian life God's teaching us. He's teaching us, and some of those are here. Uh, he's teaching us obedience. He's teaching us faith, patience, and endurance, obedience, faith, patience, endurance, endurance, discernment. He's teaching us courage. One thing above all, don't miss this one, he's teaching us dependence, not on self, not on others, but on God, dependence on God. Where do you go when you have nowhere else to go? You go to God. You run to God. Not slowly, you run to God. Run into his arms. He's waiting. He's waiting. But we're trying all of these things to try to make it work. And he's standing there with his arms wide open saying, Are you going to get it? Here I am. Child of God, you have a Savior. You have a Savior who will save you from whatever it is. Whatever it is. And bring a good end to it in many cases. And he's teaching us those things through the trials, through all of this stuff. And that we come to this place where you learn that we're self, we become selfless. It's no longer about my strength. What I can do because I can do nothing. You can do nothing. So often we trust in self. Jot the verse down. We've quoted this verse a couple of times in the last three weeks. God just wants us to get it, I think. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. By my spirit, says the Lord. I want you to underline some words here in your Bible. There in verse 4 and 5. He says, show me or make me know your ways. Then teach Teach me your ways. These are interesting words here. The words there in verse 4. Make me know or show me your ways. Literally it says what we find here in the New American. Now, one translation says show. But it literally means make me know your ways. God work in my life so that I understand you make me know your ways. Make me know your ways. In other words, God, you take control. My hands are off the wheels here. You take the wheel and you make me know your way. That's what he's saying here. Interesting. The emphasis is on knowing personally, knowing in an intimate way, and knowing by experience. Because God is doing the leading. Just letting God lead and let him show you his way. Look at the next word that he uses, teach. Every time I see this word, I have a little smile come over in my heart. It says, teach me your ways. It means to cause to learn. Teach me your ways. Cause to learn. Going through school, didn't, didn't, and don't be, don't be uh, self-sanctified here, but did any of, have any of you ever used this phrase, I had this teacher in school and she didn't learn me or he didn't learn me anything. That's not good English. I, you know that. But here's the thing. In Jesus' day, a disciple maker was one who caused somebody to learn. 
they taught in such a way that you couldn't help but learn. Now, I've sat under some guys and people that uh, in seminary, they used these four and five dollar words that nobody knew. I didn't learn anything. And I said this in a church one day. We're standing in a circle. And this lady that taught English just rang me out. She said, you, your English is horrible. I said, thank you. <laughs> and I said, I had an English teacher one time, and she didn't learn me nothing. <laughs> she came unglued, and, and she finally knew. I smiled. She said, you're joshing me, right? And I said, not really. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> but... A good teacher, a good teacher causes people to learn. This is what David said. God, you're the perfect teacher. You're the master teacher. Cause me to learn. Cause me to learn. You hold me here till I get it. You know, how many times do we read the word of God and we're thinking, man, I just cannot get my head wrapped around what he's saying. And you finally just stop and say, God, help me here. Cause me to know. Cause me to learn. What are you saying? And then the light bulb comes on. And you get it. We all have our slang language. I understand that. <clears throat> I know when I was flying back from Guatemala, we landed and had a layover in Texas. And it was a long day. We got there about 7.30 in the morning. And we flew out of there about 4.30 or 5 that night. We got in the line to go through. And I'm standing there talking to the guy that went with me, our youth guy. And I'm talking to this lady. <laughs> she turns around and looks at me. And she said, where in the world are you from? <laughs> and I looked at her and smiled. I said, ma'am, I'm from the Holy Land. <laughs> she kind of grinned. And she said, well, just where would that be? I said, northeast Georgia. That's where I'm from. Don't you wish you were from there? She turned back around and checked, done her thing. I did mine. But I love having fun with people. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is sometimes when you read it in the Hebrew, it, it looks, sounds like bad English. No. God's making a point. A good teacher. God will help you to learn. Now, there's something I want you to miss here. When he says, show me and teach me, cause me to learn. And that word speaks more of training than it does about educating. You know, train me, teach me in the way I should go. Uh, and, and this word that's used in the Hebrew, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to maybe I'll be in the camera site here, maybe not. Uh, but <clears throat> I brought this with me. I handmade this. Uh, but the word teach is where the word ox goad comes from. Anybody know what an ox goad's for? Yes, no? Okay, Ricky, help me out here. <laughs> I want you to face that door right there. No, I'm, I'm not going. <laughs> but what I want you to do, and I don't want you to walk a straight path. You can start out straight, but kind of get wayward a little bit. You got it? <laughs> now, I'm not using the point. <laughs> That, that's the ox goat. That's what David is saying. God, I so desperately want to walk in your path. Help me. Show me your way. Teach me. Cause me to learn. Please, God, I'm in the mess I'm in because I strayed. I don't want to stray anymore. I want to be aligned with God. Your sermon last week. God's telling us something. Get in line with God. Get in line with God's word. And, and you'll, you'll live a life. It doesn't matter. You say, well, what about the rest of my household? Whether they do or not, you get in line with God's word. Be an example in your household. Live a life, a godly life before them, a righteous life. And, and listen, they're going to get uncomfortable. They're going to come under conviction. They're going to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. When the pressure's hot, and sometimes you're thinking, you're looking like it, and say I'm looking at Jonathan, I'm smiling, I'm thinking, I just want to take your head off. But I don't let that out. I just let God work in me, that they see nothing but the love of God. And David was saying, God, take the ox goad. Take the ox goad of your word and keep me in line. 
because I want to live for you. I tried to do it my way and it didn't work. See, Christians do that sometimes, don't we? We want to fix it. We do something, maybe we, I, I heard something last week that blew my mind. I did not know happened. And if I called his name, you all would know who he is. Very prominent pastor. And when someone told me what happened, had no idea. He said, did you not know that? I said, I haven't heard a word. I said, you're kidding. And I still to this day, I'm still having a hard time wrapping my mind around that. That that happened in his life. This church is booming. I'm talking thousands of people. Thousands of people on Sunday. But he got out of the will of God. Am I throwing stones at him? Absolutely not. Because I could be the next one. I could be the next one. When we get like Peter, God, I'll die for you. I'll go to jail with you. I, 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 I. Self-confidence is a way down. Pride, pride. We're perfect and righteous because he made us righteous. But this human person still living inside here. And God says, Billy, you pray, cause me to learn, but I can't learn you anything. Because you're stubborn. You're self-willed. I've got this gene. My way's right. Any of y'all got that gene? I'm just being honest with you. There's one way to do it. That's my way. She'll tell you. <laughs> and there are a lot of times I have to realize, no, this, this is not right. This, 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 after you crash and burn, you think, maybe this is not right. <laughs> you know? But when we follow God's word, follow God's word. Here's the thing. You know what the yacht's goat is for you and I today? Anybody? Thank you, sir. Holy Spirit. If I'm, there's the point I'm to be at and I'm like this and I immediately, there's a little red light goes off up here. You know, uh, get back where you need to be. You've got no business over there. This is what David is praying. This is what David is praying. God, help me. Show me. Teach me. Cause me to learn. I don't want to get out of your will anymore because I know what happens when I do. I'm in the mess I am right now because of that. And he is asking God, and this is what I want us to just grab this morning just by way of application of everything here. David is praying, God, come alongside and walk with me. Keep me straight. Keep me where I need to be. Keep me in line with you that my life would honor you in every way. Did it work for David? We read in the book of Acts, it says about David, he was a man, what, after God's own heart. He finally made it. He developed that heart of God because God made it possible. God made it possible. So I want to encourage you today. Take this psalm. We're going to come back. There's so much more here that I want to share. But uh, David knew what it was to be crushed by sin. He knew what it was. He knew what it was. But he's asking God. He's asking God, lead me and teach me your truth. Teach me what is right and help me to walk in it. Help me to walk in it. And he says, through it all, God, I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. Father God, we thank you. We give you praise for your word. And God, we ask you today you know, just to take what you've given us through your word. And Lord, as David prayed, God, show us your way. Teach us your way. Lead us in your way. And God, help us to learn your path by staying and abiding in your word each and every day. God, we know there may be some here today that are struggling, going through trials and different situations in their own life. And God, they've done everything they know of to try to fix it. But God, they've never just brought it to you and bowed in an altar and said, God, it's in your hands now. I'll leave it alone. I'm trusting you. I'm just going to wait patiently for you to work and have your way. God, help us to rely totally on you as David did in all of these situations. 
And God will give you the praise for what you do. For we know it will be right. And it will be perfect in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing this morning our invitation? <clears throat> Let God have his way today, okay? <clears throat> Seems like all I could see was the struggle. Haunted. Thanks for joining us online today. If you would like more information, visit us at madisonst.org. If you have any questions or prayer concerns, you can always email us. We want commerce to know we are here for you. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week.